Good evening. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, we'd like to get things started here tonight. Um, I'm uh, Ron Smith. I'm Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies, and I'm here tonight. Uh, actually, I'm President Neil Smastrick. I don't look anything like him. I uh, don't talk like him. Not nearly as dynamic, but I'm representing him because of other commitments. Uh, this is one of the um, many events that Brookings Mountain West and Brookings Institution is ho uh, sponsoring and presenting to our community. Uh, we have the pleasure tonight of hearing from Charles, I call him Charlie, Ebbinger, Senior Brookings Fellow and Director of Energy Security Initiative. This is our eighth lecture in the Brookings Scholar Lecture Series. And uh, with each of these visits, it's just not a matter of a lecture. Uh, these scholars also meet with our students and faculty and community leaders and uh, make all kinds of very important contacts for, on behalf of the university and learning about the community as well. In January of 2010, our two research directors for Brookings Mountain West, Rob Lang, who uh, is located here in Las Vegas, and Mark Muro in Washington, D.C., launched our, our efforts in terms of the Mountain Metro's portion of Brookings Mountain West agenda. And that includes the publication of Mountain Monitor, a quarterly study of economic indicators for the Mountain West region. I'm not sure I want to see the economic indicators at this very moment, but nonetheless, um, they do that. <laughs> It's called punishment. But at any rate, visits by Brookings Scholars gives us the opportunity to bring lessons from nationally and internationally uh, known people and apply their ideas, their policy solutions, and so forth locally. Uh, their research is going to be of immense help to us on a variety of areas, whether it be water, transportation, renewable energy, health, or whatever. Before um, uh, I bring Tony Hechenova, Director of the Nuclear Science and Technology Division of the Harry Reid Center, uh, and one of our faculty liaisons who works with Charlie to the podium to formally introduce our speaker. I want to acknowledge Professor Dennis Paregis, who uh, is from our Department of Political Science and also served as a faculty liaison for Dr. Ebinger. And I want to point out his commitment to this tonight. He was supposed to be at a doctor having a very serious examination, but he didn't want to find out the verdict, and so instead he gave that up and rescheduled so he could attend tonight. Thank you, Dennis. I also want to announce the next Brookings Mountain West lecture, which will be held on February 25th. Dr. Adele Morris, who holds a position as Deputy Director for Climate and Energy Economics, will be speaking on climate change and real estate, how environmental risks and policies impact markets. And so at this time, I want to invite Tony to come on up here and introduce our, our speaker. Well, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Charles Ebinger, Director of Energy Security Initiative at the Brookings Institution. Prior to joining Brookings, he was a senior energy advisor at the International Resources Group. He also loves to teach and currently is an adjunct professor at the NHTSA School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And he previously taught as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service from 1979 to 2003. Dr. Ebinger has over 30 years of experience addressing the security, political, economic, environmental, and foreign policy interrelationships surrounding domestic and international energy issues. Experience that he gained while working with, as an executive director in a variety of energy-related companies throughout the 1970s, 80s, 90s, both domestically and abroad. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Washington chapter of the International Association of Energy Economists, and he received his BA from Williams College and PhD from the Fletcher School of International Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Please help me welcome my friend and colleague, Charlie Ebinger. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Tony and Ron, for those very kind words. I am indeed delighted to have an opportunity to be with you tonight to talk about the subject of the nuclear renaissance 
uh, should have had a question mark at the end of that on whether there is a renaissance or not. Uh, but before beginning my formal presentation, I'd just like to review some basic history. I'm sure everybody in the room, when I mention these events, will uh, understand what I'm talking about. But I think it's important to put the whole subject of atomic power in context because, of course, no subject is probably more controversial today within the energy arena uh, than the subject of the future of nuclear power. <clears throat> it's important to remember that from the very dawn of the nuclear age, following, of course, the U.S. victory in World War II, following the dropping of two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, <clears throat> the devastation of this technology, as well as the promise of this technology to provide cheap electricity to people throughout the world was recognized. Uh, and it was also recognized that if we kind of had a beggar thy neighbor plan in the hostile environment with the Soviet Union that we came out of World War II, that it would be detrimental to global peace and security. So very early on in the immediate post-war period, Bernard Baruch in a very important plan uh, highlighted in his belief the need to put all atomic fissionable materials under control of a United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. Essentially, the United States is the lead nuclear power in the world at that time, would give all our fissionable materials, as would the few handful of countries that had access to such materials. <clears throat> of course, the Soviet Union, given the uh, political rivalry we had at the time, saw this as a ploy backed by the Americans to ensure American dominance of atomic power and so the Soviet Union vetoed the proposal for United Nations Atomic Energy uh, Commission. And this led in 1946 to the passage of the Atomic Energy Act, which in various manifestations uh, and uh, amendments continues to this day. As written in 1946, it was so feared of what could happen if this technology fell in the wrong hands, we literally put the term used in the literature was a veil of secrecy. It became a criminal offense for people involved in certain aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle to even discuss those issues in a scientific conference. I can remember as a young man, when I first got in the nuclear area, going to scientific conferences, and some Hans Beth was uh, speaking, and all of a sudden he said, I'd like to tell you more about this, but I can't, and would say, you know, top secret. Uh, so we come out by 1940, so we try to keep the genie in the bottle, as we say. Uh, by 1946, after the passage of the Atomic Energy Agency, the world becomes even more fearful when in 1949, the Russians for the first time uh, ex uh, test an atomic device. Uh, and this, of course, generated fears of a global arms race. However, in 1953, President Eisenhower who saw the promise of civilian nuclear technology and what it could do in such a broad array of fields, such as not only, of course, the generation of electrical energy, but what it could mean for advances in medicine with radiology, what it could mean for eradicate, uh, you know, nu using nuclear technology to preserve foodstuffs, a whole host of applications that President Eisenhower believed would benefit the world more than the dangers of nuclear weapons proliferation would hurt the world. And so in 1950, he in a very dramatic Adams for Peace speech, he promises that the United States will embark upon a program to make nuclear energy available to the power-starved regions of the world, as well as benefit these other technological areas I just mentioned. This led, as part of President Eisenhower's initiative in 53, this led in 1957 to the formation of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, which in addition to the technological programs the United States was sponsoring to bring people from all over the world to learn more about uh, the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, the International Atomic Energy Agency was set up not only to do the same thing, to help countries uh, develop their nuclear energy sectors, but also as a watchdog agency to ensure that under the rubric of civilian uses of atomic energy, in reality, that was not just a simple clandestine diversion of nuclear materials for more nefarious purposes. <clears throat> As a result, uh, shortly after the formation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, the world is 
re reminded of the dangers on the proliferation side when France uh, 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 has its first nuclear test in 1962, followed by China becoming a nuclear power in 1964. Ironically, it was just this time in the early 1960s, in fact, 1963, that the first major orders for commercial nuclear reactors began with General Electric consummating a number of sales. And following that expansion of commercial nuclear technology, uh, the 1960s and on in the 1970s became the heyday to date of the nuclear energy uh, era. Uh, this is when reactors began to be built, widely used around the world to the point where we got to um, where, we, where, we, where we are today with a very vital uh, nuclear energy industry <coughs> in many different countries of the world. But the nuclear non-proliferation issues remained also front and center and in addition to the uh, prospects for civilian technology. And so <coughs> in 1968, recognizing that we had to reconcile how we were going to expand civilian nuclear technology as well as uh, uh, deal with the issues of non-proliferation, the global community came together and signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which remains in effect to this day. Uh, it actually went into force in 1970, but it essentially says, and we'll talk about this more <clears throat> in a minute, the trade-off in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty <clears throat> is that countries that agreed to forego uh, either the direct acquisition of atomic weapons or the direct acquisition of parts of the nuclear fuel cycle that could lead to the building of atomic weapons. In exchange for foregoing that, they were promised the fullest possible, the language in the treaty under Article 4 is actually the fullest possible exchange of nuclear technology. Keep that phrase in mind because it becomes very important <coughs> down the road. And in the second major component of that treaty, was that the existing nuclear weapon states agreed to move to complete and total unilateral disarmament. That also is an important phrase <coughs> of the treaty to remember. But the big push and the big interest in civilian nuclear technology really accelerated after the first oil shock in 1973-74. Because as the price of oil rose up around the world in places like Western Europe, Japan, Korea, the Far East, the United States, parts of the United States, nuclear energy was seen as a way of backing out the use of petroleum that was now soaring through the roof in price, as well as deep concerns about the security of supply of oil coming from the Middle East and other politically volatile regions of the world. So in the immediate post-OPEC era, we had a surge in orders and interest in nuclear power and this in turn generated a new concern. Namely, if the trends that were, looked like they were on a one track upward forever were to have occurred, countries started saying, is there enough uranium <coughs> in the world for all these nuclear power uh, advances in all these countries? And this, of course, then asked the question, <coughs> what can we do about the, uh, the viability of uranium supplies? When you, and I'm sorry for those of you that could explain this far better than I in this room, but when you, in a conventional nuclear react, reaction, when you have uranium, and through a process called enriching the uranium to a point where it can be used to generate a commercial nuclear reactor, once you have that enrichment facility in your possession, theoretically you can continue to upgrade the enrichment level to a point where you can also <clears throat> make a nuclear device. You only need relatively lowly enriched uranium to generate a civilian nuclear reaction. For a weapon, you need very highly enriched uranium. But the problem is many countries saw the acquisition of an enrichment plant uh, not necessarily as a way to de facto become a nuclear weapon state, but under the supply security concerns that you, they didn't want to have to buy enriched uranium from another country that had it under the rubric that that country might potentially cut them off down the road. 
And ironically, there were so many orders coming into the United States uh, for enrichment services from other countries. Ironically, the United States became concerned that we did not have enough enriched capacity to supply all these other countries. And so <clears throat> we closed what we did. We closed the order books. We said, we can't supply any more u enriched uranium than what you have already ordered, which, of course, reinforced the concerns of these countries that that is exactly what could happen in the future and to some extent got countries interested in pursuing their own enrichment plants, de facto also potentially raising weapons concerns. The problem with the NPT is that ironically, <clears throat> most of the countries in the world at the time that we were worried about as potential weapons proliferators uh, never joined the NPT. So even though we had this marvelous document where if you, for, if you said you would forego any ability to acquire nuclear weapons, you would get all, any aspect of commercial nuclear technology, the problem is the countries we were most worried about weren't, in the, weren't inside the tent, so to speak. <clears throat> so for example, two countries that at the time had very serious historic rivalries, uh, Argentina and Brazil, neither initially joined the NPT. South Africa, under the deepest, darkest days of apartheid, clearly did not join the NPT because they thought nuclear weapons would be the only possibility of stemming off, as they said at the time, the black hordes from the north. Seems kind of ironic, and given what subsequently the peaceful transition South Africa has had to the modern age. You had, of course, Egypt and Israel with their historic animosities not agreeing to sign. You had North Korea not agreeing to sign. You had India and Pakistan, uh, historic enemies since the time of independence, not agree to sign. <clears throat> so although you had this NPT conference, and there were a handful of others, North Korea and a handful of others that initially did not, Libya did not join uh, the treaty. So in the aftermath of 1973-74, we have the surge in interest in nuclear power because of high oil prices. We also have a situation um, where in 1974, India detonates its first bomb, so we have another nuclear weapons state in the arena. So this is generating very sharp concerns about, uh, about what to do. Again, when the, fall, when the Shah of Iran falls in 1979, uh, and the price of oil goes through the roof once more, people again say, oh my God, we've got to get more nuclear and other alternatives because once, how, long, how long are we going to wait for the price of oil to go to $100 a barrel? And if you go back and look at the Wall Street Journal and other people, there were people, there were learned articles saying that OPEC was going to have so much money from all the world was paying for oil that they would be able to buy up every commercial company on the New York, New York Stock Exchange. These were considered serious pieces of investigative journalism. And they were also followed by learned economists and learned universities <coughs> writing similarly. The only problem was, right at the same time, in March 1979, we had our nuclear accident at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. We won't spend a lot of time uh, talking about what did or did not happen. If you want to get into that in the question and answer period, we can. But the point is that generated complete shutdown of the nuclear power industry for all intents and purposes for, the for close to the next 30 years, almost where we are today. Uh, some reactors that were in the pipeline uh, prior to TMI were completed, but many were not. And in total, nearly $100 billion of what we call stranded assets meaning nuclear power plants that were in the pipeline but not allowed into the rate base was essentially evaporated. Now, of course, down the road, some smart utilities, down the road, some smart utilities, seeing these bankrupt entities ended up buying up these very expensive plants on cents in the dollars. A company, there's a utility named Exelon in our country. They built their company about buying these distressed properties, and now they're one of the most profitable utilities in the United States because they bought billion dollar plants for 150 to 300 million dollars each. 
and they now operate <coughs> quite successfully, quite economically. <coughs> and then the last event I want to lean you with so we can come up to the current time is, of course, the, ne the next setback for the industry was in 1986 when we had the very severe accident at Chernobyl in the Ukraine leading to a huge amount of radiation release. Uh, and given that fact, it led a number of countries in Western Europe, which had previously been strong supporters of nuclear energy, to either shut down or cut back their nuclear power programs, only to, this, at this point in time, be reconsidering whether those were wide moves. So I hope that sets the stage for how we got from the past to where we are in the current, which is, of course, a much more interesting uh, thing to talk about. This is just a quick rundown of where we are as we're speaking today in terms of the contribution that atomic power makes to electric power generation around the world. Uh, you see roughly 30 countries, I won't read all these, but roughly 30 countries uh, uh, involved in commercial nuclear reactions, 30, 372,000 megawatts of total capacity. Just to put that in context, you know, uh, a typical big coal plant might be 600 megawatts. Big nuclear plant historically might be 900 to 1,200 megawatts. Uh, and, of course, natural gas and other plants smaller than that. Roughly 15% of the world's electricity. We currently, after all these years, have eight countries known to have nuclear weapons capability. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that all have acknowledged that they have nuclear weapons capabilities. We have 56 countries operating civilian research reactors. And, why, and while this is, imp this is important, because increasingly fewer and fewer use highly enriched uranium, but there are still a handful of research reactors for technical reasons that do use high enriched uranium and so potentially uh, are of concern. We have roughly 30 new reactors under construction worldwide as we're speaking. We have 90 new reactors that are officially announced that are going to be built this does not include the nearly 100 reactors that China uh, has said they plan to build. And you'll see a handful of countries get well over 50% of their electricity from nuclear power. Actually, in the case of France, it's above 80%. But there are, there are countries uh, where it's very important, with the United States getting roughly a fifth of our electricity from atomic power. If the nuclear renaissance is occurring, either in the United States or globally, why is this occurring at this point in time after the legacy of what we saw following Three Mile Island and Chernobyl? First and foremost, I would argue, is about concerns about climate change and CO2 emissions. Because whatever your concerns about nuclear waste, safety, whatever, it has the very sharp advantage that it releases no CO2 emissions. So in that, or limited CO2 emissions, if you count everything that goes into building it. And so when you talk about our electricity future in a non-carbon world, I would argue you really are talking about a mix of technologies focusing on nuclear energy, wind, solar, energy efficiency, demand-side management are all things we can do more of. Uh, hopefully, we will find a way to sequester carbon, but until we do, uh, that is the mix of technologies that are and geothermal that are most front and center on the agenda. The other thing, reason that the nuclear renaissance is occurring is the fact that worldwide electricity demand is, at least prior to the global recession, was growing through the roof. The International Energy Agency in Paris, uh, in their most recent forecast, had predicted a global increase in electricity uh, power worldwide by 60% by 2030. So if you go back to think about that 372,000 uh, contribution nuclear makes, if we're going to have 60% of total electricity, that's all the oil, all the gas, 
all the energy sources. Clearly, uh, if we start foreclosing one option or another, uh, that has major demands on where we're going to get the electricity from, from other fuel sources. We, of course, are looking towards the future at least. Uh, we're moving from hybrid vehicles uh, to plug-in electric vehicles, very likely full electric vehicles if we can solve the problem of the battery technology. But again, down the road, that will be another call on electricity demand and supply that aren't right now plugged into the models about where we're going to get global electricity from in the future. There's also great in interest in nuclear technology for desalination, as we have many parts of the world increasing, increasingly uh, short of water. Uh, nuclear power offers a great technology to help uh, generate more water, clean water supplies around the world. If you look way out on the hydrogen vehicle demand, which some people, some people take a, a strong view that hydrogen will never be a major uh, vehicle, vehicle fuel, but there are others who argue that hydrogen will be, and to get to the hydrogen using nuclear technology to create it uh, is one possibility. And the other thing is we have an aging global energy infrastructure. It's really across the board, all fuels, but particularly in the electric power area, we have to do something. We often hear about, you know, and people say off the top of their heads, well, we don't need nuclear power, we don't need coal, because we've got all this wind and solar resources in the United States, so why don't we just develop it? It is absolutely true that we have enough solar and wind power in the United States to someday have our electricity grid basically be solar and wind and conservation and new delivery technologies. But the problem is our wind resources on the Great Plains and our solar resources in the Southwest, where we're sitting today, are far away from major load centers, meaning major cities, metropolitan areas. And our grid is essentially fragile because it is old we essentially have three separate grids with only a minimum of interconnections. And we're talking about something in the neighborhood by an estimate by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recently, about $250 billion. That figure is debated. Some people say a little bit lower. Some people say substantially higher to build, to build a new grid over 10 years. Cur I think I don't need to tell anyone in this room, given the current fiscal state of the nation, the likelihood of that happening uh, soon seems unlikely. And we should not confuse the centralized grid, meaning the big power lines you see across the country coming out of a place like Hoover Dam, with the so-called smart grid. The smart grid can be part of the big transmission grid, but the smart grid, at least as I define it, is much more the interactions that we will have from your local utility company to your household, which will allow tremendous energy savings, but it should not be confused with the need for the centralized uh, grid. We also have a renewed interest in uh, nuclear because of broad questions of energy security. You know, we want to reduce our dependence on imported energy sources of all kinds. And when you look at countries like Korea, and Japan, that uh, not only are dependent for all their oil, they're dependent for all their imports of coal for electricity generation, LNG, liquefied natural gas for generation. So a number of countries see nuclear in the utility sector as critical for their energy security. And finally, we have a very fascinating issue, which is the public perception of nuclear safety which despite what some people may think, is actually getting better. And particularly in areas where people have been exposed and live with nuclear power plants for many years, uh, in the public opinion polls put out by the Pew Research Center and others, not only the public perception of nuclear safety, but the public support for nuclear power is statistically rising, a fact that often gets neglected in the overall energy debate. Now, this just gives you an idea of 
what is actually happening uh, in the so-called nuclear renaissance. Just very quickly, trying to give you a worldwide overview. In Europe, we have these countries considering a major regional joint project, which would be uh, a very sizable project. In the United Kingdom, because of aging reactors and the fact that they historically used a different technology, which proved not the best way to go, the English are looking at not only replacing their aging fleet of reactors, but making a major additional expansion of atomic power. We have Finland and France. France, of course, one of the leaders in the nuclear power area, considering a sizable expansion of their nuclear activities. But that said, uh, you can't neglect the fact that there have been some setbacks. Uh, currently, Arriva, the French company, is building two reactors, one in Finland and one in France, that are considered the next generation of reactors. And when they were planned, they were put forth as these are going to solve a lot of the concerns about cost, about safety, whatever. Um, whether they prove that ultimately or not remains to be seen. The reality is that they are both dramatically over budget. They are both dramatically behind the schedule. And so the cost savings that we hope to see from these reactors is at least at this point in time not occurring. And we also have Italy, which after Chernobyl closed down all their nuclear power plants, uh, literally closed them down. In some cases, they literally dismantled them, uh, now reviving its nuclear program. This is kind of a busy slide. Uh, tried to get too much. But again, just kind of giving you an overview, in Russia, we're talking about a doubling of nuclear capacity from a very high base uh, by, tw uh, by 2020. They're actually talking about having a floating nuclear power plant in a remote part of the country uh, uh, as early as 2012. Canada, our neighbor to the north, which embarked on a different technology from the dawn of its nuclear era than we did, called the Kandu reactor, the situation with the Kandu reactor is it uses the very small part of uranium, a natural uranium that occurs in the total uranium supply directly, obviating the need for an enrichment plant. The problem that worries some people about the Kandu reactor, though, in the course of power generation, it produces plutonium directly. So some people continue to believe that the Kandu reactor from a proliferation standpoint uh, is worrisome. And the decision just in the last several weeks of the Canadian government to sell the Kandu reactor company, it's always been a state company in Canada, has generated concerns who's going to be allowed to buy this Kandu uh, technology. But the Canadians are also looking at the possible use of nuclear power to accelerate the vast extraction of oil sands out in Alberta, a huge petroleum-like energy resource, one that has terrible environmental problems, but a huge resource. And most of those oil sands would be destined for the United States once they're put in a liquid form that we could use in this country. We have South, in Southeast Asia, uh, we have Vietnam planning its first plant uh, by 2017, but it intends very rapidly to build number two, three, and four. And that may be the next point of contention among uh, reactor vendors uh, for commercial competition in the future. And we have opportunities uh, for nuclear power plants in those other Asian countries you see, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines. East Asia, South Korea, uh, excuse me, Japan and South Korea, two very large nuclear uh, countries already uh, planning to expand their fleet. South Asia, both India and Pakistan, have various vigorous plans. Uh, Pakistan's, I doubt, ever come to fruition. Uh, but India is a country to watch, and their current plans call for 10 new reactors. In the UAE, we've had a situation where uh, there's been fierce commercial competition because the UAE announced they were going to buy four reactors just in the last several weeks. They have decided to buy the reactors from Korea. This generated shock waves in the commercial uh, industries of the United States. 
because GE and the Japanese firm Hitachi, who are partners, they thought they were in good shape to make the sale. Uh, Arriva, the French company, thought it was basically a done deal. Uh, Mr. Sarkozy went out there and wooed everyone, but in the final analysis, uh, Korea, Korea got, uh, got the sale. And I think we have to be careful uh, if you're into commercial nuclear business in this country or in Europe, the South Koreans are getting very vigorous and pushing ahead. And the concern, not that South Korea is anything but a reliable ally to the United States, but the concern that we have when we talk about the nuclear renaissance, unless these sales really start occurring in the 10s and 20s and 30s so that every vendor in the business can get enough sales you know, to keep them commercially viable, the concern is can we get to a situation where certain vendors start making special deals, particularly looking the other way on technologies that might be worrisome down the road, particularly uh, if the technology is going to countries that are in politically insecure or volatile parts of the world. In Africa, uh, outside South Africa, I have my doubts, but Nigeria and Egypt are certainly uh, two countries that have been talking about nuclear power. And I mentioned uh, uh, in India, I was actually low, excuse me, India plans to build 20 to 30 reactors, not the 10 I mentioned and recently signed uh, a deal with the United States and a number of other countries that will vastly accelerate commercial trade between the United States and India and, uh, and many European vendors. The India sale, in my opinion, was a mistake. And the India deal with the United States, in my opinion, was a serious political mistake. Because India, if you remember what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, remains a non-signatory to the NPT. Now, you can say that India is a nuclear weapons state, so you know what are they going to do? Divert when they already have a nuclear weapons program. But I think the message it sent to the rest of the international community is that you can get all the goodies in terms of the exchange of some of the best technology in the world, even though you have flaunted the international community uh, since 1974 uh, by not agreeing, not becoming a signatory to the NPT, and not being a, a maybe a good nuclear citizen, although the Indians will counter that by saying, we have never transferred nuclear technology that would be sensitive to any other country, so that they argue they have, in fact, been a good a member of the international regime. Looking at Latin America, we have some great interest in uh, Brazil planning to build a number of plants. Brazil is interesting because it has 5% of the world's uranium reserves. It also has a huge volume of thorium, which I won't bother you with the details right now, but thorium is a potential additional fuel cycle that at least uh, makes Brazil continue to experiment with thorium. Brazil is also interesting because it is one of the few new countries that say they want to enter the commercial worldwide enrichment market. So here we might have another country uh, with the potential to sell enriched uranium, which we would want certainly to be assured was not going to be uh, transferred to a country uh, where there might be concerns. Argentina, which has one of the longest standing uh, nuclear scientific groups uh, going back many, many years to the dawn of the nuclear area, uh, uh, continues to be interested in atomic power, and we get very interesting uh, uh, potential for the expansion of the industry in Chile and Mexico. This just gives you an idea of right now, it's a fairly limited universe out there of the, at least the big uh, vendors who can actually sell these very expensive pieces of machinery. Um, these are certainly, China is one to watch right now. China is so absorbed, and as I mentioned, trying to build 100 reactors in their own country, uh, that they aren't particularly an actor in the international marketplace, but one has to watch in the future, uh, will, that, will that change, and I don't, uh, I don't have the Koreans up here, which I, which I should. But the point is, it's a fairly limited number of major actors. So as we look towards, is there a nuclear renaissance or is there not, and what are the critical issues, if there is, that we need to be thinking about? Clearly, 
we need to look at preventing the further spread of enrichment and reprocessing technologies. And in this regard, I want to, I'll talk about more about reprocessing in a minute. In this regard, in addition to Brazil, both South Africa, Australia, Canada, and Kazakhstan, all of whom have large uranium resources, have all expressed at least some degree of interest in becoming suppliers of enrichment fuel. So you do have the potential to see a whole new group of suppliers. And if you go into the commercial nuclear enrichment market, this is a high cost venture. You don't go into this market unless you think you can make commercial sales. And so the concern is, once again, if all these countries were to go into the market, now we don't worry about probably Canada and Australia. I don't mean to sound racist saying that. But you know, Kazakhstan, I don't know whether we would uh, think that was a good thing to have happen or not, but would they beggar thy neighbor uh, to make a sale in a way that might not be appropriate from a non-proliferation standpoint? Now, reprocessing, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. Reprocessing is a big debate. Uh, after, you generate, uh, after you generate power in a conventional reactor, uh, in, our, in our mainstream reactors using enriched uranium, you generate electricity, uh, you have spent fuel. This is the spent fuel uh, we were talking about, you know, storing in Yucca Mountain and others. It's important to understand spent fuel is a very complicated subject. I've been talking to some of your top people here, and I'm convinced you have some of the best talent to understand this subject, probably uh, certainly in the United States and not the world. When you, have, when you have spent fuel, some of it is solid, some of it is gaseous. Uh, and so you have to treat that differently. But the issue is, once you have reprocessing technology, which, say, would allow you to extract the plutonium. Plutonium is generated in the course of a nuclear reaction. It is not a naturally occurring fuel like uranium. Uh, but it is a very dynamic potential fuel source for the future, and particularly if you're worried about the supplies of uranium down the road, the plutonium offers a very valuable resource if you can extract it and use it as fuel, as does some of the spent uranium that's not burned up in the initial reactor. You can also ex, uh, take that out and use that as a fuel or mix the plutonium and uranium, what we call a mixed oxide fuel. So it enters immediately into questions of nations of security of supply. It has the advantage that in the course of reprocessing, you burn up some of the most dangerous nuclear waste. But if you have reprocessing technology and can extract the plutonium, you have the capacity to make a nuclear weapon. This is the dilemma that the world faces, uh, that you're trying simultaneously deal with fuel supply security a very valuable fuel source. You're trying simultaneously to manage the nuclear waste issue, uh, and there is a serious trade-off here that is not an easy question. So what do we do all about this? We clearly need, at a global level, uh, a robust nuclear power management system. Uh, there have been a number of proposals on how to deal with this. Some people have proposed, and this was actually endorsed uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors. Some have said we should multinationalize or lateralize, whichever way you want to say it, uh, all enrichment and reprocessing. It should be under joint international supervision, uh, overseen by the International Atomic Energy Agency, and carried to its nth degree, this would include countries that have existing enrichment and reprocessing facilities turning them over to international management. Now, I don't personally think that's politically a starter, uh, but it's certainly a, a desirous goal, perhaps, looking down the road. But at least people are saying, in terms of the further expansion of the industry, it would be much better to multilateralize this under international control than to have a whole number of new market entrants coming into the system and maybe letting the system get out of control. Clearly, a component of that uh, multinational regime would be ways to deal with the nuclear waste issue, whether through reprocessing, 
whether long -term, through long-term storage. These are very contentious issues. But they must, point I want to leave you with, they must be addressed. Because long-term, there is no future for the nuclear power industry, and, and it's making a vital contribution to world energy and climate change uh, management if we don't long term find a way to deal with the nuclear waste issue. We may get by, again, people in this room better positioned than I, we may get by 50, 60 years using dry cast storage and other techniques being used in other countries. But long term, we must deal with the nuclear waste issue. And keep in mind again, if you forego that, if you simply say, I don't care, I don't want this technology, it's too dangerous, then you tell me where that contribution that nuclear energy currently makes to the world's energy scene, what are you going to replace it with, particularly if we find that coal cannot be sequestered or cannot be sequestered either technically or commercially. We may find that we can technically do it, but it may not be commercially viable. So again, uh, uh, we're looking at nuclear fuel supply guarantees. And by this I mean if we create this international regime, it can't be subject to a country coming and saying, well, I need some enriched uranium, and the United States or some other uh, country saying, no, we're mad at you about some other thing you're doing in the international uh, arena, and so we're not going to give you that. It has to be assured that if a country comes for either enrichment or reprocessing activities, that they would be honored. On the negative side, is there a nuclear renaissance? We have to look at the costs of, the current costs of building a new nuclear plant, operating it, whether, it needs, whether they can only operate with subsidies. Just a day or two ago, the president and the United, President Obama, you know, increased the potential uh, subsidies that will go to the next generation of nuclear power plants from $18.5 billion that's been in the legislation since 2005 to I think $55 billion or there around. Uh, but the reality is to build a nuclear power plant today, at least in the United States, you're talking a grassroots nuclear power plant. You're talking seven to nine billion dollars a plant. A point that is often not noted is it is much easier to build a nuclear plant in Europe or Japan, uh, leaving aside questions of licensing and uh, you know, environmental controls for a simple reason. Those utilities are much, much bigger. They're bigger financial entities than most of our utilities are. With the exception of about 10 utilities in the United States that are big commercial entities. For a typical electric utility to decide to build a nuclear plant, and if anything goes wrong with that during the course of construction, I'm not talking about an accident, it's simply delayed, some, something goes wrong with the engineering, so the plant doesn't come on. Many utilities in this country would be putting their entire electric utility at financial risk. They could have their bond ratings pulled on all their power plants, whether they're oil, gas, solar, whatever. They would be unable to borrow money. So this is a very real question, and it's really one of the reasons that President Obama has realized that if we want this technology to move forward, we're going to have to at least be a lender of last resort uh, to the industry. And finally, and then we'll go move to the questions, Finally, I think a, a critical, oh, I'm sorry, I got one. Uh, finally, a critical issue is as we have an enhanced nuclear renaissance and more sensitive nuclear materials and much greater volumes moving around the world, uh, what kinds of concerns do we have to make sure that there's no risk of clandestine uh, diversion of various kinds? Now, the, the non-proliferation treaty, I'll do this quickly, the non-proliferation treaty we talked about set up in 1970 every five years is reviewed. And it happens to be the case that this April is the next review conference. Uh, we have a few critical issues, and I'll just highlight those quickly. Again, remember, Article 4 of the NPT says, if you don't build a weapon or try to build, get the materials to build a weapon, you get the fullest possible exchange of nuclear technology. 
a country like Iran, and I have no breach or sympathy for Iran, but a country like Iran, which is a signatory to the NPT, will sit there and say, fullest possible exchange doesn't say no enrichment or reprocessing. And more importantly, you nuclear weapon states haven't disarmed. So what are we talking about? You know, this treaty is discriminatory. Uh, that's one major issue. Another major issue is that under the NPT, with 90 days notice, you can withdraw. Now, North Korea is a prime example of a country that had finally signed the NPT, engages in a clandestine nuclear weapons program, and the minute they think they have the technology, they say, we withdraw. And yet, they're now a nuclear weapons state. So we've got that article. Some people say the way we need to change the treaty is either saying if you do that, if you get the technology and get a capability and then withdraw, everything you got while you're a treaty member should be under international supervision. What you do after that, you know, that's your sovereignty. But can you really imagine any country's going to agree to that? So we have other problems, but in the interest of time, uh, we have, this is probably the most important that in some parts of the world we have uh, dangerous materials that are not always secured effectively. We don't always have adequate enforcement when a country flaunts the will of the IAEA or the international regime unless the Security Council is willing to take dramatic action the IAEA has no enforcement capability itself. Let me cut off there since we're near the end of time because I want to save some time for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Move out here so I can see hands. Any questions? It's hard to see in the back, so please. Uh, yes, sir. LG, uh, just a second, I think I can tell you, I think I can tell you exactly. Uh, Dosan, Hyundai, uh, Samsung uh, are the three biggest in a technologic, technological standpoint, and then it's uh, Kepco, Korea Electric Power Company, that's actually the utility involved. Well, I'm talking about, you know, if you needed to finance seven, eight, nine billion dollars on your balance sheet, that would be very difficult. I mean, you could, if you had a balance sheet, you can do it. But if you have to go in the marketplace right now and borrow seven, eight, nine billion dollars, I don't think you're going to find the banks rushing out to lend it to you. So what I'm saying is a lot of them wouldn't be big enough to do it. And if they could do it and anything went wrong, it could endanger their entire balance sheets. Yes, sir. Particularly interested in the comments you made on the shift in public opinion uh, for this nuclear renaissance, perhaps especially from people in Washington, what the public opinion is going on. What do you know about mere access or mere knowing <coughs> and what's known publicly? If you're talking about <coughs> the United States and reactor generation, we, we know, well, and it's pretty well publicly demonstrated. We know we had a very serious potential situation at the Davis Bessey plant in t near Toledo a number, a number of years ago. A Brown's Ferry. Uh, we know we've had uh, some releases of serious materials in Japan. Uh, I mean, but place it in context. Nothing of the magnitude that we had at even TMI where no radiation was released and certainly not Chernobyl. But there have, been, there have been accidents around the world. There have been spills in transport. But again, radiation was not released because it was in tight container vessels that had been said to be safe and proved to be safe. But I'm sure, you know, we, we have reason to believe there were some serious releases of radiation in some of the uh, Soviet nuclear power program. And I imagine there are some others we don't know about. Please just ask a question. I can't really see hands here very easily in the dark. Question about uh, nuclear waste. Is there <coughs> any general agreement on how to dispose of nuclear waste around the world? A general agreement? 
there, there have been a number of countries through the years that saw uh, offering to be a nuclear waste, site of a nuclear waste storage facility, they saw a commercial advantage to this. I, I remember, I think it was Niger in Africa that offered it uh, from time to time. Kazakhstan offered it. Uh, the Chinese have, uh, I don't think the offer's any longer on the table, but at one point in time, the Chinese, and I'm sure, I'm sure there are some others I'm forgetting about. I think it's going to be very, very hard to get international agreement. Uh, I mean, you look at countries that are kind of in the forefront uh, of the technology, such as, say, France and Japan. I have visited both their sites. You know, I, I don't think the storage of nuclear waste is a technical problem. We can argue, you know, whether Yucca was the right site. I think there are sites where it can be done, from what I have read and people I talk to who are experts on this, which I am not. Uh, I think the problem is a political problem. And, you know, I think Nevada was probably not sold the best way it might have been, but that's water over the dam at this point in time. Uh, but I think the question people have to ask themselves, do you believe that nuclear, and I'll put it very starkly, is do you believe that storage of nuclear waste is a more dangerous problem than CO2 in the atmosphere? And I'll go for the CO2 in spades. And so I don't think we can start knocking out technologies that don't emit CO2, or we are going to have very, very serious limitations, at least over the next 20 years, of how we're going to you know, replace that contribution that atomic power not only plays today, but has the potential to play much more vigorously in the future. Yes, ma'am. No, I do not. Um, this, is always, this is another contentious uh, issue. Uh, there's certainly people that would say, yes, it does. Uh, I believe from what I have read that using uranium conventionally and what we know we have, now that doesn't mean the mines are built and it's very expensive. It's close to $5 billion to build on, bring on a new world-class uranium mine and it takes a good while. So you've got to make sure that supply keeps up with the demand uh, or you could have severe. But I don't think uranium is constrained, certainly not for 60 to 200 years. Now, after that, yes, and this becomes, this comes back to the recycling <coughs> question. Do you want to be able, if uranium comes up against those supply constraints, do you want to be able to extract both the spent uranium, which you can uh, reconfigure and use again, and the plutonium as alternative fuels? Uh, you know, it's the same old question of the oil when I hear people say, oil's running out. Uh, you know, peak, the peak oil theorists. Unless you tell me what your pricing assumptions are, and the same is true with uranium, what your pricing assumptions are and what your technological assumptions are, uh, that is a question that is impossible to answer. I, I always like to point out to people, it was when oil went to $10 a barrel in 1986 when the market collapsed that the greatest improvements in extraction technology occurred because if the industry hadn't found ways to lower their costs and be much more efficient with three-dimensional seismic and a whole host of technologies that allowed them to pinpoint much more closely where oil was or wasn't, the industry would have collapsed. But, you know, just on the downside they did it. So likewise, on the upside, when oil was $150, people were looking at technologies that, you know, certainly wouldn't make sense in today's pricing environment. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, in the uh, debate between Newcomen and Paul, <coughs> do you think that the Poland is going to deliver on Jim Paul technology? I do. Uh, and I, you know, at the, at the risk of sounding propagandistic, I, you know, we did a Manhattan project in a very small period of time on technologies that we knew far uh, less about than what we know about what's involved, at least technologically, in, uh, in carbon capture and sequestration. I think the difficulty is going to be on CCS is uh, finding the capital to put, you know, to do 10 or 12 demonstration plants, even though the president, forget what number he called for in his speech, uh, 
and I think that's the way to go. Do some demonstration plants all using different technologies because there are a number of different technologies people think are the way to go. But coal worries me even more because, you know, that's 50% of our electricity. And if we found we can't build more coal, and it's 70% of India's and 80% of China's. So if you talk about that we cannot, as a globe, burn coal efficiently, there is no solution to the CO2 problem. I mean, I want to take that home. There is no solution to the CO2 problem if we can't burn carbon uh, and coal uh, safely. In any, you know, in any time horizon in our lives, or anybody's, any of our children's lives, probably. I think we're moving beyond time. Unless there's a pressing question, we'll, any, is there one more maybe we could take? Okay, well, thank you all very much.